everyone. Thank you for joining our office hours that are exclusively for adult day centers. This is our sixth office hours in this series. My name is Emily Varville. I am the project manager at Leading Age Virginia. Leading Age Virginia is an association of not-for-profit aging services organizations serving adult day centers, senior housing, assisted living, nursing homes, and home and community-based services. If you missed any of the previous sessions, the recordings can be found on our webpage, and we will place the direct link to those recordings in the chat now. As always, I'm going to start with a few housekeeping notes before moving on to our content for today. If you would like to ask a question, please use the chat option at the bottom of your screen. You may raise your hand if you would like to verbally ask a question, and all links will be placed in the chat as needed. All office hour sessions will be recorded and you will have access to those recordings and the slides after each session. Most office hour sessions will be set up in a similar format consisting of a short presentation and then an opportunity for question and answers at the end. We invite guest speakers to come and give educational presentations about a variety of infection prevention and control topics to ensure that each center can learn about current infection control practices that are applicable to your center. The next session will be on May 8th at 1.30. By registering, registering for today's session, you should already be registered for the next series, but feel free to share this link with other colleagues that may also benefit from attending the office hours. So I am so excited for you all to see the new IPC resources we have developed for adult days. We are launching a set of resources developed for participants, their family members, and caregivers at home. By implementing at-home infection control best practices, the participants benefit from a healthier environment, and these practices also contribute to the well-being of center staff and fellow center participants. Three at-home resources have been developed by Leading Age Virginia and were reviewed by infection preventionists at HQI. The topics include hand hygiene, eight things to do when you feel sick, and cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting at home. These resources are scheduled to be distributed to your centers later this April. We are also working closely with HQI to create a new model IPC template policy on COVID-19 protocols specific to the adult day setting. We'll have more information to share about this policy at the May office hour session. So I'm going to launch a couple poll questions just to get us kicked off for today and you will see them pop up on your screen. And while you guys work on that, the main content for today's session will be a presentation by Mary Lachlan from our partner on this grant, Health Quality Innovators. This presentation is full of information about common viruses, their symptoms, current trends, and ways to prevent the spread in your centers. This topic was specifically requested by one of your peer adult day center leaders during a one-on-one -on -one session with me. So we are excited that Mary is here today to help meet that need. Mary Lachlan has been in healthcare for 27 years, she spent several years managing the infection prevention program for a hospital corporation and consulting for a variety of settings, including assisted living, long-term care, acute care, and behavioral health. Mary has a master's degree in nursing with a speciali specialization in infection prevention and is board certified in infection prevention. She currently works as a senior quality advisor for health quality innovators. Please help me by welcoming Mary Lachlan to our meeting and you can begin whenever you're ready, Mary. Okay, thanks, Emily. So as Emily stated, this session is about viruses. And as we know from our experience with COVID-19 over the past several years, they can be very virulent. In another word, powerful. A lot of the slides in the presentation contain links that are live so that you can investigate some of the resources at your leisure after the presentation. If you haven't had an opportunity to review any of these videos by Dr. Carlson, I urge you to find them on the CDC website. These are part of the Project First Line Education Library and are great resources for education. So Emily, if you can start the video, we will learn about viruses from Dr. Abby. Hi everyone, I'm Abby Carlson. I'm an infectious diseases doctor at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta, Georgia. We are continuing our infection control series, our inside infection control video series today. 
uh, from Project First Line, and we're going to talk more about viruses, specifically how viruses make us sick. The things that we do for infection control for COVID-19 are all to keep the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, from getting into our eyes, nose, and mouth, or someone else's, where it can make us sick. But a question that you might have is, well, how does that happen? What does a virus do when it gets into the body to make us feel sick? Knowing a little more about how viruses work helps to understand the things that we do for infection control. We talked in another earlier episode about the parts of a virus. If you haven't seen that episode yet, please do go check it out when you're done here. But today we're going to talk about how viruses are able to use cells in living things, including people, to make more copies of themselves, to spread within the body, and to move from person to person. So our bodies have billions of cells. They are like microscopic building blocks. Our cells are very different from viruses, but they do have some things in common. And one of those things is that they have little parts made out of protein that stick out of the surface of the cell, just like a virus has proteins that stick out of the surface of the virus. And some of those little parts that stick on the outside of the cell, they work like a lock on a door. If you have a key to that lock, you can get into the cell. If you don't have a key, you can't get in. But viruses that can make us sick have found a way to make a false key, a little part that sticks out from the surface of the virus that will fit into a lock on at least one type of our cells. It's not an exact match, but it's close enough that the virus can hack in and invade that type of cell. It's not that our body's meant for this to happen. The locks on our cells aren't for viruses, they're for things our bodies naturally normally do. And viruses can't hack into every cell type, just the ones where their keys match the lock closely enough. But when a virus can get inside, it hijacks the machinery of the cell and uses it to make more copies of itself, including more copies of that false key. Those new virus copies with their false keys on the outside, they then break out of those infected cells and move on to infect new cells. And in many cases, the cell that's been infected and hijacked is destroyed in the process. As the virus starts hacking into more and more of our cells, the body recognizes that, oh, oh, there's an infection. The body then sends out an alarm to rev up the immune system so it can fight off the virus. And it's actually that activity of our immune system getting to work that makes us feel sick. That's where the fever, the chills, the cough, and other symptoms come from. Now, there are times when the immune system is fighting a virus, but a person doesn't feel sick. When this happens, that person can still spread virus, even though they don't know they're infected. And it's a big problem for infection control that we're gonna talk about more in another video. So what happens when you're infected with a respiratory virus, whether you know it or not, and you cough or breathe out or talk? Well, your droplets with virus in them are carried out, reaching other people, getting into their nose, mouth, throat, and lungs, and infecting them. And this whole process in the cell that we just talked about starts all over again. But we don't want that to happen. And that's why, as we talk about these things that we do for infection control, you'll see that many of them focus keep on keeping respiratory droplets out of the air and away from other people. As always, thanks for joining us. Please be sure to follow up with us on Facebook or Twitter and check us out on the web at cdc.gov slash Project First Line. We'll see you back here for the next episode. She just has a great way of talking through some um, kind of complex things. So I hope you'll I hope you'll look for those on Project First Line's page on the CDC website because they are they are really well done. So this graph shows an increase in emergency department visits across the country as of 3-9-24, so about a month ago. 
that are related to COVID-19, flu, and RSV. And the black line is a combination of the three viruses. As you can see, COVID-19 and flu continue to circulate and impact healthcare facilities. You can access this data anytime by going to the CDC's webpage dedicated to trends in viruses. I believe um, Betsy or Emily will drop that link in the CDC link into chat for you. From this site, you can monitor the trends of these respiratory viruses and more. You can also see state trends by accessing the monthly VDH update, which is an excellent resource for staying up to date with what's trending in Virginia. Just type in VDH situation update and the month in your browser and you'll see the resource. They do an excellent job with that as well. Next slide, please. So let's talk about respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. And all the, although the graph on the previous slide didn't demonstrate a high level of circulating RSV, it's more of a fall and winter virus. It's important to note that RSV can make people very, very sick, especially people that are over 60, those who have chronic issues or weakened immune systems. So having an awareness regarding these symptoms is important for the care of the individual and for preventing transmission. For this graph, we wanna narrow our focus to the maroon line, which shows us the percentage of persons 60 years or older that have received a vaccine for RSV. And as you can see, we have work to do, educating about and gaining acceptance for the RSV vaccine. Because vaccines are so important in preventing viruses, several of the upcoming slides will, will be used to highlight a specific vaccine. Most hospitalizations associated with RSV in adults occur in those age 60 or greater. Hospitalizations are usually around a week long. And in a recent um, morbidity and mortality report published by CDC, um, in 2023, the experts stated that clinical outcomes in patients hospitalized with RSV were worse than those among patients hospitalized with both COVID and flu. So this is a virus to be taken very seriously. Next slide, please. The good news is there are vaccines tailored specifically to, for this population at risk. RSV vaccines appear to provide protection for about two years. Late summer and early fall administration provides the best protection as the research shows. And the vaccine can be given on the same day as other adult vaccines. Next slide, please. Flu is another virus that likes to rear its ugly head in fall and winter. And we typically refer to flu season as the start of fall and the end of spring. So we're actually still kind of in it here. It typically peaks between December and February. And most of us are very familiar with these symptoms, kind of an annual expected thing for a lot of people. So those symptoms should not be unique to, to you. Next slide, please. So while you're taking in this slide, which shows in blue, those persons over the age of 18 who were vaccinated against flu as of mid-March. Now think back to that first graph we looked at that clearly showed flu is still circulating. Again, we have some work to do in educating folks about vaccines and gaining, gaining their acceptance because as long as a virus is circulating, it can make people sick and it can make elderly people, especially those with compromised immune systems, very sick. Many healthcare providers give flu shots through May if the virus is still circulating. Certainly if an individual is at risk, they should get a flu shot and everyone should get a flu shot annually. These are some great resources that you could, you could laminate and post in your facilities. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <laughs> and that brings us to our recent nemesis, COVID-19, an extremely virulent virus with a wide range of symptoms producing mild to severe symptoms. 
We are all very much aware of the devastation COVID-19 has caused with the extraordinary number of hospitalizations and deaths. Many of us know numerous individuals whose lives have been impacted by COVID-19. And some know individuals who continue to be impacted by long COVID. Next slide, please. So this graph shows the vaccines, the orange line, for a broad population, 18 and over, and it is relatively low. Looking at the CDC vaccine trends, um, just last night, the CDC reports that the percent of the population reporting receipt of the update, updated 2023-24 COVID-19 vaccine is 22.6% for 18 and older including about 42.5% among adults age 65 and over. Those statistics were published on April 5th. Next slide, please. Of note is the recommendation that from CDC that those persons 65 and older receive another COVID vaccine in addition to their updated dose. And why, and why do they need to do this? Well, <laughs> I can attest to the fact that as you get older, nothing works exactly like it did before. <laughs> and that includes your immune system. So as you get older, your immune system just doesn't function like it did before. And therefore you don't get that sustained impact from the vaccine as you might have when you were younger. So really important for aging people to pay attention to that and get an additional vaccine. Next slide, please. So these next few slides contain resources that you can laminate and post in your facilities, or you can provide them as handouts. And just as a reminder, I, I use the word laminate a lot because when you post things in your facilities that, that are meant to remain there and for, for everyone to, to visualize, it's really important that they be wipeable. So you wanna laminate them or at least put them in a protective sleeve. And anything you choose to post, if we could go back to that one, um, anything that you, that you choose to post should come from a recognized resources like your local public health agencies, CDC or the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology to name a few. There's a lot of resources out there not all of them are as vetted as those that you'll find from actual state or federal agencies. So this infogra infographic is a really good reminder of all the things that we can do to prevent respiratory disease from spreading. In addition to the power of vaccines, there are other things that we can do to reduce the risk of transmission of viruses. Hand hygiene, hand hygiene is a tremendous strategy to prevent illnesses in general from being transmitted. And we can certainly appreciate the power of clean air. CDC has some great tips and tools for ensuring air quality in healthcare facilities. Additionally, we need to promote overall health and make certain folks are getting the appropriate treatment for the conditions that they have. And of course, if people are sick, they need to stay home. Additional strategies include the masking that we've used in the past when appropriate, making sure physical distancing is used when needed, and testing for viruses when necessary. Of note, a respiratory pathogen panel for testing typically includes COVID-19, RSV, and flu. So it's one test. Next slide, please. These are additional resources that would be ideal to provide to residents, participants, families, and or staff. Lots of really good succinct information, and they usually contain links that they can investigate for further information. Next slide, please. I love these, I love these resources for staff. Um, very eye-catching and informative. And again, there are links there for them to investigate further. Great tools. So this is a resource provided by, by the Virginia Department of Health and it provides step-by-step -step guidance for a respiratory protection program. 
I highly encourage you to check this out and determine what's right for your facility, the people in your care and your staff. Let's talk about another virus that's not a respiratory virus, but still a very contagious virus that can make people very, very sick. Norovirus frequently causes diarrhea, hence the very apt CDC poster, are you sitting down for this? Love, I love that poster. And as the poster suggests, consistent, appropriate hand hygiene is the most powerful defense against norovirus. So that would be a great one to post wherever staff, staff gather. It's disturbing that norovirus is attributed to so many hospitalizations and deaths every single year, 900 deaths, 109,000 hospitalizations, almost 500,000 emergency department visits, closing in on almost two and a half million outpatient clinic visits. It's just, it's a very virulent, very contagious virus, obviously. Next slide, please. So there, this is another great tool uh, for residents, participants, and staff from the Virginia Department of Health. Um, as with most viruses, uh, with the chronic health, people, those with chronic health conditions and weakened immune systems are at greater risk. Um, and next to this is a very brief video that packs a punch in terms of highlighting the wallop that norovirus is. I'm not hearing this at the volume on that. Hmm. I'm not sure what's going on with the volume because it's not playing on my end either. Hmm. Hmm. All right, we might be watching it just without sound. That's okay. Um, the intent was that for this to be a very visual image anyway of what norovirus is. <laughs> so as you can see, there's a lot of a, a lot of vomiting and a lot of diarrhea and a lot of uh, very diligent cleaning up afterward with the with the appropriate tools. <clears throat> so. In the United States, is a germ outbreak, that spreads oh, quickly and easily ago. from a sick person to others. It causes vomiting. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I don't so, know. In, back to the, okay, back to it. In the United States, outbreaks of norovirus occur most frequently during late fall, winter, and early spring. As of March 1st, norovirus rates are elevated uh, actually across the country. In fact, there have been nearly 300 outbreaks of norovirus since January 1st of this year. Next slide. As we learned, hand hygiene is the most powerful tool we have in our arsenal to prevent the transmission of norovirus. Um, CDC has some great resources to foster hand hygiene among your staff. I highly recommend that you do um, training on appropriate hand hygiene, it sounds very simple, but it, there's, there's, it just is a tremendous gain on the part of everyone if staff can perform it and be observed while performing it. The retention there is just much more valuable than if they didn't, a, a demonstration was not offered in a return demonstration. And they should be educated Staff should be educated about norovirus and the expectations for preparing food and even when to stay home when they're sick. So I come through a lot of resources in an effort to provide you with the best of the best. So I hope you'll take a look at this list of resources that are intended to assist you with educating everyone about virus prevention. The best practice cards on this list are resources for staff, as are the Virginia Infection Prevention Training videos. So lots of great, great tools for you to um, reinforce your infection prevention program.
And I'll be sharing these in, in an email after the session today. I'll send all the resources out so that you have them and the links. And then of course you'll have the recordings and the slides as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mary, and for your very informative presentation. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions for Mary, we will share her contact information in the chat, but she'll also be on for the rest of today's session and can answer questions during the Q&A. This is just a quick slide that includes my contact information. You can always reach me by email to set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting, discuss resources that your center may need, or talk through implementation of the template policies at your center. And Betsy will drop my email address in the chat just so you have it. I am now going to be stopping the recording so that you feel comfortable sharing and asking questions during the Q&A portion.